welcome to the Paranormal Peep Show. This is Neil Geddes Ward with Andy Chaplin, and uh, you you're listening to us in December, I hope, uh, for the Christmas edition. And, and obviously, we're all getting festive around here. Andy, are you getting festive? Um, I'm a bit of a bear humbug type person, so I'm not massively into Christmas. Um, however, uh, I've just been to Brighton with a group, a group of friends and had an amazing time. I do like the Christmas lights, actually. The Christmas lights are good. They are quite impressive. They are, they are quite indeed. I, I don't like the the incessant commercialisation and inane Christmas carols and songs and things playing on literally every speaker in every shop you go to. <laughs> Well, that's it. I don't go to shops much these days. <laughs> that's probably the best way to avoid it, actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's only so much you can take. Merry Christmas, everybody, by Slade. Um, mm. I mean, can you imagine working in a in, in a, an all year Christmas shop, which do exist in various places where really? every day? Oh yeah, where oh, every day God. is Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God! That, I mean, for the people working there, Christmas must be an absolute nightmare. You know, in their personal <laughs> lives, so they've just had enough of it. Probably end up in asylums, I should imagine. Yeah, I think you need some sort of counselling or something. Um, yeah, well, obviously don't apply for jobs um, in, in a Christmas shop if you're a real um, bar humbug type person. Yeah, um, so not me. <laughs> I actually saw, funny enough, talking about bar humbug, I actually saw this film on Netflix yesterday, uh, and it was called The Man Who Invented Christmas. And it was actually the story of Charles Dickens right. about how he came up with the whole idea of a Christmas carol and uh, how he published it in about five or six weeks just before Christmas. He had to self-publish it and he managed to get it out <laughs> just in the nick of time. And it became his best-selling book. It was really quite interesting. Um, so much so I actually thought of actually buying the book myself to actually read it, even though I've seen the film so many times. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's a very paranormal film, actually, if you think about it. It's probably one of the, you know, it, 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 it's got ghosts of Christmas past. And <laughs> I, as a kid, I didn't really understand it. And, and it's quite a weird concept. You've got ghosts of Christmas past and ghosts of the future and things like that. And you've got this very sort of pagan looking kind of Christmassy Father Christmas ghost as well, which... Uh, well, yeah, well, of course, um, Father Christmas, the, the whole red and white thing, there's a lot of contention about where those um, colours came from. Uh, some people say it was to do with Coca-Cola branding their um, kind of drink along with Christmas and selling it through Father Christmas. Um, other people say it's to do with the red and white toadstools, the hallucinogens that people used to take um, in medieval times. So, yeah, I mean, the, the red and white thing is, is a, I think, is a fairly new uh, phenomena and I think uh, Father Christmas used to be actually kind of like a dark blue or, or dark green and white I thought he was dark green I do remember the Coca-Cola connection hearing that when I was at college at art college and they talked about it then so mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah interesting interesting yes anyway uh, as we're on the subject of ghosts and spirits because we are a paranormal peep show anyway I think it's pertinent that we introduce our guest who happens to be another fellow presenter on the paranormal UK radio network uh, do you want to introduce her or shall I? Uh, you go for it now. Okay. All right. I have been in, uh, interviewed by this uh, lady a few years ago myself. I also met her many, many years ago uh, in Scotland, in, and that's where she's um, calling in from. And it's Alison Dunlop of the ADX Files. Hello, Alison. Hello, Neil. Hello, Andy. How are you both? Hello, Alison. Yeah, pretty good. Beautiful. Pretty good. Is it cold up north? It is really, really cold, very windy, very wet. No, you don't want to be here at all. <laughs> but the, uh, uh, yes, uh, you say that, but have you got snow? Because if you've got snow, we're coming. Not right <laughs> now, no. Well, further up north, further north, uh, where they do all the skiing up in Ronesse, really? they'll have Cairn Gorms, they'll have snow up there, I'm sure. Yeah. Now, you're in Glasgow, aren't you, Alison? I'm in Glasgow. I'm in yeah. the lowlands, not the highlands. Yeah, um, but just outside Glasgow, you've got the uh, lovely lakes and things, just literally north of you, haven't you? In, in I forget Beautiful, what Beautiful, yes. Yeah, yeah, and across yeah. the way, you've got the Western Isles, you know, out on the... Uh, Aran, is it? I can't remember the islands off... Uh, yeah, oh, well, there's there's uh, several. There's, you know, you've got the inner and the outer Hebrides. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, Aaron is just across from my hometown of Ayr. Yes, yes. Um, uh, and it, it's a very magical place. It's got standing stones, lots of standing stones. Mm. And um, it used to intrigue me when I was a little girl because you could sit on the beach and some days it was like you could reach out and touch the houses on it and other days it was completely gone like Avalon it just had disappeared <laughs> in the mist yes in the fog yeah yes uh -huh. I remember uh -huh. that when I visited the Isle of Skye because it was uh one minute you see it next minute you don't type of mm. thing 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. <laughs> now, I know that when I visited Sky, it was very, very religious. Uh, every cafe, every hotel, every shop had a Bible on its counter. Uh, mm. Is it is it like that in southern parts of Scotland or in Glasgow, or is it a little bit more kind of uh, not so kind of strict, as it were? N- not at all in Glasgow, and um, I think... Was I, I think it was in the sky once and it was just like, you know, I run round it in, in my friend's car. Uh, I think we went into one shop and it was a, a small shed type thing and the guy was um, making Celtic things. Um, he looked very pagan himself. Uh, I don't know whether he was, but he looked it. Um, so I never saw all this. Um, this is news to me, this Bible on every counter thing. Um, but in the, the islands, having said that, they they are um, free Presbyterian. So um, they, they are uh, very, uh, very religious people. Um, but in the, the, the lowlands and probably in other, other places in the highlands, no the rest of Scotland, I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't say so. I mean, relig- they are religious. People are religious and spiritual too, not necessarily religious, um, but uh, they, they wouldn't necessarily have Bibles everywhere. Could it be mm. possible that there's a Bible belt as such in Scotland? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, if that <laughs> that's a good way of putting it. I think and there yeah, is. Yeah, I would say I would say the, the, um, the Hebridean Islands would be, would possibly come under that um, because they are, as I say, free Presbyterianism is is uh, pretty different from Presbyterianism uh, in that there are certain rules that, that you tend to follow, like uh, now, this is this is a, f- a friend who who came from Uist told me this that um, the the women are not supposed to have their hair cut uh, short. Um, you wear a hat to church. Um, women wear dresses and skirts, no trousers. Mm-hmm. You know, it's all the, all these kind of things. Now that is completely absent from uh, the Church of Scotland Presbyterian Church. Mm. So it is pretty, um, it's, I mean, you might call it strict. Maybe they don't feel that they're, you know, that it's strict when, when they're in that uh, religion. But um, I passed one of these churches just up the road from me. And it was the first time I had ever seen anyone coming in or, or going out. And uh, all the women right enough were all wearing hats. And I thought, oh, so that that is true. So there you go. <laughs> Well, it's interesting, actually, because I've been to, as I mentioned, the Isle of Skye, but the, I was actually staying on this island called Rase, which is between mainland mm-hmm. Scotland and Skye. And I think it's only got like 50, 60, 70 people on the island, mm. if I remember rightly. And we stayed in this little cottage. My children were very small then. And, of course, I take them to the little play park uh, to go on the swings and roundabouts of that age. And there was an official council notice, uh, and I actually took a photo of it because I couldn't believe it. It was an official council notice put there on the fence of the play park saying, please do not use this play park on a Sunday. Wow. Uh, And I couldn't believe that. And I took photos of it. And I was telling all my friends down south, and they couldn't believe it. I said, look, here's the photo to prove it. Yeah, uh, yeah. (laughs) And when I lived in the Orkney Islands, which is off the north coast of Scotland, they're not so, so religious like the west coast. But... um, I remember Mm -hmm. talking to the vicar on the island that I lived at at that time, and he said that he actually came from that area. And he said, yeah, they're very strict out there. He Mm. said that he even knew a guy whose job it was to work for the council, whose job it was to go round and actually chain up the children's swings so they couldn't actually use them on a Sunday. Wow. Can <laughs> yeah. you believe that? Not, yeah, to be confused, I, not to be confused with chain up the children. That would be yeah. Yeah, very. I know. I really <laughs> wondered how north. that sentence was going to end. <laughs> But you can believe that. You've heard of stories like that, have you, Alison? Yeah, yeah, I have. Um, it's a little bit like that film Witness. Um, and, and, uh, well, the Harrison Ford film with yeah. the... Um, you can't... Um, yeah. Was it... Hey, Amish. Amish comedian. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, what's, the, uh, what's the other one where they, they weren't allowed to... Was it Footloose? Um, so like there's like no dancing on a Sunday and all this kind of stuff. But you're saying that um in the north, the northern islands are not yeah. so religious, but well, they they do have um uh, very 
they still have very uh, strong beliefs in uh, fairy lore, uh, fairy culture, and um, it's taught at school as well. The the, the same as in uh, parts of Ireland, they they teach uh, the the children about fairies. So uh, that's quite strong there. That's interesting because mm. the island that I lived on, Westray, which is in the Orkney Islands, we actually had a fairy museum, uh, which was supposedly the only one of its kind in the UK. It was basically a gallery of my pagan and visionary artwork, mm -hmm. along with my then wife's uh, research into fairy lore and things. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> we had lots of visitors come around from the islands and look at it and lots of people come over on the boat to look at it. Um, but I never recollect anyone sort of talking about it, the fact that it was taught in schools. I mean, my mm -hmm. both my children went to the schools there, but they never mentioned anything about being it taught in Westray, but maybe certain schools didn't. Um, having said that, there were three churches on that particular island. It was only about 600 people. Yeah. And quite a few people went to the churches, but eventually it got to the point where not enough people were going to all three churches and two of the vicars had to be made redundant, if you like. And mm -hmm. uh, it all came down to one church uh, in the end. But, um, <coughs> yeah, I mean, even, even mending dresses, I was told, mending dresses on a Sunday because you've mm -hmm. got a hole in your dress was was frowned upon or putting your washing out on a Sunday is frowned upon. Yeah. Uh, I find that really, really weird in my yeah. – obviously because I'm coming from a totally different set of non-Christian mm. beliefs and things. Uh, yeah, totally. I mean – they they just uh, uh, prefer to keep Sunday as uh, as in, as intended in in Christianity as a day of rest, and they take that very seriously and very literally. Um, but I have to tell you the story. It's entirely up to yourself whether you keep it in the show. But um, my friend who came uh, from the the Western Islands, she told me that. Uh, there, there was this very, very strict uh, minister. Um, you couldn't do this, you couldn't do that, you know, and, and he was very, very strict. And every Sunday he would uh, go into his uh, private room and pray and nobody was allowed in. And when he died, they went in that room and in that room was a stack of porn. <laughs> Prayer to the god of porn, the horn god. <laughs> 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 so, um, yeah, so that that was uh, one story. Now, whether it's true or not, I don't know. We want it to be true. We want, but I really want it to be true. So, no, one of those islands, the island's uh, missed over. <laughs> Alison, what's the kind of like the general Scottish view on uh, the paranormal? Is it something to be um, celebrated? Do they find it interesting, or is it kind of like hush hush? Oh no, I would say it's it's. Um, very prevalent in Scotland. It's it's uh, very celebrated, you know, and we have our conference once a year, which has been really successful and really enjoyed by a lot of people. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you ask any Scot if they have it, it doesn't even matter if uh, they don't believe in it, because that's how they'll start it a lot, especially <laughs> men will start it. Well, I don't believe it myself, but I'll tell you something strange that happened, <laughs> and then you'll then you'll get this story. Um, so even if uh, they they don't particularly believe in the paranormal, they they will know of something either that's happened to themselves mm. or that's happened to someone that they know. The and uh, yeah, I was going to say, funnily enough, I know um, uh, I used to play airsoft. I've probably told this story before, um, used to, which is kind of like um, paintball, but it's with plastic pellets. Mm -hmm. uh, and there used to be an abandoned shopping mall in Reading called The Mall, funnily enough. Um, and there was a, a very kind of like staunchly atheist, doesn't believe in anything type Scots uh, person that used to kind of help organise it and manage it. Um, I don't think it was the actual owner, but it was certainly kind of uh, managing it. And it was it was absolutely, you know, one of those classical things where I don't believe in any of all this, but... <laughs> uh, and it turns out, and, and Neil, do you remember um, one of the guests we had called Ashley Sibirini? Ashley. Yeah. Ashley. Yeah. Uh, you've gone uh, very faint again, Neil, I don't know. Oh, okay, I'm back again. 
and back yep. again. Okay. So um, Ashley Sabarini was actually one of the zombies at this shopping mall. Uh, so uh, during this shopping mall, some of the the games, the airsoft games, were zombie based. So people get dressed up in movie style, kind of like uh, zombie makeup, blood everywhere, and there'd be kind of like plastic wrap sheets with blood dripping down them and fake bodies hanging everywhere. So it's all very kind of zombified. Um, so it was actually Ashley who um, let me know some of the weird ghost stories um, connected to this mall because although it was a it was a shopping mall and quite a modern one it was actually built on quite um old land and and old shops before it and there actually used to be a, a serial killer called amelia dyer in the vicinity who used to go to this this um reading uh shopping mall uh, well shops as it was back then sort of in the 1800s so anyway this particular um scottish manager um one thing that apparently happened to him was he was in the canteen area um at night uh, because sometimes what they used to do on a on a Saturday, if they were doing something, they would then kind of uh, sleep over sometimes for the Sunday rather than go home. So it make, makes a lot more sense to kind of like stay in the area if they're going to do two consecutive days. So there was uh, he was sleeping in the canteen area. He heard like chairs clacking around in this kind of old canteen area. Um, and he thought it was some of the staff playing up or playing a joke or, or you know, just uh, buggering about. Uh, so he went to investigate. And there was nothing there. Like he, like some of the chairs had been moved apparently, but there's absolutely nothing there. Um, and there was a succession of these various creepy haunted stories. Um, and he'd actually experienced it himself, uh, but he couldn't explain it. His his atheist kind of like rational mind couldn't quite explain what was going on. And apparently his viewpoint on it was, I don't know what it is, why it's happening, but as so long as we leave it alone, it'll leave us alone. And that was his kind of philosophy. <laughs> mm. Mm. Yeah, some people don't believe just because they're scared. Yeah, they're scared to believe, and I've I've met people like that as well, who even if you present them evidence, they just don't want to know because they're too scared um, to to take it on board. Mm. Um, so for you, Alison, I mean, obviously you're a believer in pretty a, a lot of the paranormal because obviously you've got this show uh, which is now on the paranormal uk radio network called the adx files which is the alison dunlop x files uh, but you've been running that show for quite a while before you came onto the network i mean your interest presumably led you to develop that show how did all that begin well, it started, um, I was at a radio station uh, near Glasgow um, and I was doing print reading for the blind there. So I was just reading out the, the news, um, the daily news from the papers and recording it. Um, and then we were asked, did anyone want to, we were, they were looking for new presenters and I said, I'd love to do a show. Um, and they said, what kind of show would you like to do? Well, there was another woman who was doing a pagan show. Um, so I thought, well, it can't be anything pagan related. Um, and I, I immediately said uh, paranormal, uh, UFO, world of the strange type stuff. And they were delighted with that. Uh, and, and so I started doing that there. And I did 10 shows, but it was only one hour um, once a month. And I really wanted, apart from the fact that I had to, you know, make quite an effort to get there um, and, and back, uh, I, I started to think that it might be better to do the show from home if I could work out how to do a podcast in the house. So that was a whole learning curve in itself. Um, and it, it took me, it was all kind of, you know, self, self-trained in uh, radio production and uh, which was fun and and I really I really enjoyed doing it it's the one one of the few things in my life that um I've not that I've stuck at but that I've enjoyed doing that I wanted to perfect I'm not saying that it's perfected but to begin with you know I would like religiously listen over to uh, my shows um solely to find out what I didn't like about them um, you know, did I say something a certain way or did I repeat a certain thing or whatever? And I would make notes not to do it again, which is kind of difficult when you're in the moment and you tell me and you do it again. But, um, you know, I, I tried to, uh, you know, get it to what I what I thought was was uh, was its best. Um, and it was the same with the, uh, the recording of it and the editing of it. 
you know. So I've never been a perfectionist about anything really, but um, it's one of the things that um, I I am quite with with the the radio show, and I've really I've really fallen into it. But um, I used to do uh, paranormal stuff um, investigations years ago in the nineties with Malcolm Robinson, and um, uh, so I, I, I did a, an investigation on Jura, which uh, was a, a UFO incident over there. Um, it started off; people had seen this moving light coming over Glasgow, and um, it ended up hitting a hillside over in Jura and uh, it just so happened that I was going to be visiting the next week so I was able to talk to people who had seen it so that that was one of the one of the things that I did uh, back then and um, yeah so I was always quite interested in paranormal things so when when the when the opportunity to do a show came up I jumped at the chance Wow. So obviously your, your interest in the paranormal led you to develop the show. Uh, and I suppose Andy and I have got kind of points in our lives where we think, ah, I, I know why I became interested in the strange and the weird because of something happened or mm-hmm. I saw something on the TV that kind of prompted my thing. What was the pivotal moment for you? Presumably going back to childhood, was there something that happened that prompted you in this direction? Um. <sighs> I, I don't know if anything in particular, but um, we, because I had a, a pretty normal childhood and um, I don't remember having any paranormal experiences in early childhood. Nothing springs to mind. But when I was at nine, we did move into a very old uh, Victorian uh, flat um, with the first floor and the attic floors which had been made into bedrooms and that's where I slept and um, it was it had a great history, it had a great atmosphere and uh, I really wanted it to be haunted (laughs) and the the story of it was that it had been built a hundred years before uh, by the woman the old woman who had lived there, it was her father who built it and it was her family home and she had ended up living there her entire life. And I had this romantic notion that I would do the same um, and, and I really wanted to see this uh, this old woman who used to live there, but uh, I didn't see her. But one day I, I was looking into um, this, I've got this beautiful wedding uh, photo of my grandparents and it's it's a mirror it's a photograph within a mirror and uh, I don't know if you've ever seen anything like that before it's absolutely, I think it's stunning Um, and uh, so I was looking at it I was looking closer and closer to to look at all the detail of it and uh, I suddenly heard breathing in my ear Hmm. and (laughs) leapt 10 feet in the air I ran down the stairs. My brother was at the bottom. I was screaming the whole way. <laughs> My brother was at the bottom of the stairs and I jumped into his arms and I said, the mirror's breathing. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so that um, uh, was really the only uh, story that I've got from, from childhood. But um, when I was about 14, my... Uh, my, that's when my interest in possession and exorcism began because um, my my dad used to, uh, when my mum was in uh, night shift, we would sit and watch the old Hammer Dracula films with Christopher Lee mm-hmm. uh, in this old Victorian house. <laughs> and uh, so I really enjoyed uh, these films. And my grandfather said to me one day, I was about 14, um, he used to buy books whenever he saw them in, in uh, second-hand shops. And he said, you like all that horror stuff, don't you? And I said, yes. He says, well, I saw this book. You might like it. And, and he gave me this book, and it was The Exorcist. <laughs> he had no idea. <laughs> he had no idea what were, what was in the pages of this book. Um, and, and so I read it, and, and there began a... A, a real interest in the subject 
And um, obviously now I, I give lectures on the subject and I'm hoping to, I have a calling to be a, a, an exorcist, a deliverance, a, you know, minister. Um, have you been involved in exorcisms no. yourself? Um, not with a person, but <clears throat> um, I did an exorcism in my flat. Uh, now, a couple of things were happening at the time. I was researching a talk for the the uh, conference last year, the 2018 conference, but also I had stuff, work stuff going on in the flat and a workman had come in and I'd got this bad vibe off him. I don't often get a bad vibe off of people, but there was just something about him. He wasn't unpleasant, but there was just something about him. And when he left, there was still a presence in the flat. It felt like there was still somebody there. And I thought, oh, no. And he, well, I can only assume that he had left this attachment in my flat. Um, that night, there were noises in the hallway, uh, clicking and clapping and this kind of thing. Um, I went out to investigate, couldn't find anything. Uh, the next morning when I went through to the living room and I opened the curtains, there was this um, like, like a slam uh, near the window. And it was like a book being slammed on a book or a, the palm of a hand being slammed really hard on top of a book, something like that. And then after that, the kitchen flooded. And I thought at that point, I thought, no, this is not happening. Stood in the middle of the room and I said, uh, you can't you can't settle here and you cannot attach yourself to me. Um, th this is my home and you're not welcome here. I don't care who you are. You're not welcome here. Mm. And there was nothing for a fortnight. And about a fortnight later... I woke up with some invisible presence above me. It had me by the wrists. The um, the walls were shaking um, and I'd heard scratches from the walls as well. And uh, I just fought off this um, invisible presence. And I was very angry as well um, to begin with when things like this, because I have had other experiences of the, this type of thing, and it would terrify me. As as is quite you know normal, um, but that changed at some point to um, anger. If I was my territory was encroached upon, and um, just out of I, interest, I, were you were you angry before this happened, or because no, no, because of it. Um, it, it, you know, dared to attack me and, and it wasn't going to happen. And so I, I fought it off and, and that was, that was it. It, it, it left for t another two weeks. Now, during that time, I decided uh, I needed to do um, a, a big cleansing and basically an exorcism in the flat so I did that um, I used uh, various things like salt and holy water and holy oil that I'd made these things myself and um, blessed them uh, the, the holy water was was blessed. It, it was uh, I'd got it at Carfin, which is a beautiful place. It would have been blessed by a, a Catholic priest, and I blessed it also myself. Um, and and so I did this big, you know, and there was uh, incense and and whatnot, and um, signs of pentagrams and crosses uh, everywhere. So uh, I I really did the works on the flat and. After that, the the only other thing that happened was when I was sitting on the couch, uh, just on my laptop, two cats beside me on the couch, and the next thing, the entire ceiling, it was like hailstone on glass. You know that sound? Yeah. That yeah. really heavy hailstone, uh, hailstones. And I thought what 
on earth is that the only way it could have been coming from upstairs was if somebody was standing hovering in the middle of the room and throwing lots of little beads uh, on the on the ground very forcefully and I couldn't see this happening so um I don't I didn't know what that was but later on I was reading uh, an account of a, a possession and the exorcism um or, or leading up to the exorcism and after the exorcism there was very similar things to what I'd experienced like the walls moving the scratching um the psychic attack and lastly the hailstones on the ceiling and it said that this was the you know all the the energy leaving after the exorcism it often happens mm. um so i don't know quite what it meant by the energy leaving whether it was that negative entities energy leaving or whether it was the energy of the exorcism itself i, I i'm really not a hundred percent sure. I would have to ask somebody else who who knew a bit more than me. Um, but that was a a very interesting uh, time, and that was just last year. So, mm. and and you say that the the cause of it, the bring the bringing in the bringing in of it, um, was due to this man coming to your house. Yeah, because it hadn't been there before. Um, and I, as I say, I'd got this feeling off of him that I didn't like. I really didn't like it. Now, I had had a few workmen coming into the, the flat at that time and they were just workmen and I hadn't really thought anything either way of them, you know. Um, they might have been, you know, pleasant or whatever and this guy was fairly pleasant, but uh, I just felt there was something about him that I really didn't like. And afterwards, there was this presence that hadn't been there before and it just felt like somebody was still in the flat. And when when you live alone, um, you you know how your flat, you know how your your environment feels Mm. And you get used to the noises, don't you? You get, well, yeah, you get used to the noises, and um, I mean, obviously, the two cats who instantly were also looking at the ceiling that that night when there was the hailstones, uh, the noise of hailstones. Um, yeah, so I mean, I just knew there was something else there, and it didn't feel particularly nice. Mm. Um, it felt like trouble, and the the psychic attack to me proved that it, it was um something negative definitely so it could it could be him it could be a number of things it could be something attached to him it mm. could be that maybe he's a very either dark or depressed or very negative person that's a possibility mm -hmm. it could even be a possibility that maybe he's into dark things maybe like mm. satanism paedophilia or whatever yeah um, so if you were to like hazard a guess what would you what would you think might be going on with him Oh, um, well, I personally think there was a, a negative presence, a negative spirit. Um, what that means or whether that had was having an effect on him. Mm. Um, he, he seemed okay, if a little bit forward and familiar in a way that a workman usually wouldn't be. But apart from that... Um, I wouldn't have thought anything much else of him, but um, I think that it was a spirit attachment. That's that's my feeling there. Now it might have been attached to him because of the type of person that he was, um, it, or it may have been something that influenced him. You mm -hmm. you know you I would need to know him a lot longer uh, mm -hmm. to to discern that. And of course, if he's, uh, you know, if he's a workman, he's going to be visiting a lot of buildings and a lot of buildings well, with <laughs> weird things going on. Well, yes, and that is a really good point that he could have picked this up from anywhere that he'd visited, and um, you know, where I, I think that we're all vulnerable to um, to these things happening, and we have to be careful where we go and careful what we do in these places um, and, and make sure that we are um, we're protected in some way. Mm, I think so. 
Um, do you think that um, exorcisms and kind of like uh, possessions and demonic stuff is more prevalent in Scotland, would you say? Are there, are there are for instance, cases, um, I don't know if you'd know this, in the Catholic Church where priests are called out to deal with this kind of thing? Do you know if it's on the increase? Well, according to the Catholic Church, exorcisms are on the increase and they are trying to get more people involved in uh, exorcism ministry. Um, so I, I would, I mean, I don't know particularly in Scotland because uh, no one has come to me as yet to say I'm possessed, I believe I'm possessed, can you do an exorcism? Um, which is great, that's that's good, that's good. Uh, despite my calling to, to be an exorcist, it's great if uh, people are not possessed. <laughs> um, so I, I've not heard of any cases at the moment, but then a lot of people, and quite rightly, go to a, a trained minister, uh, particularly Catholic priests. Um, they are very, very well trained. In fact, I would love to do the um, the exorcism course that's run by, at mm-hmm. the Vatican. I would really love to do that course. And they've opened it to other churches now. So um, I'm hoping that maybe one day that will be a possibility mm-hmm. to do that. Um but yeah, they're they're very well trained, and and quite rightly, people tend to go to them. But it's also not very much spoken about. So I don't know how many possession cases there might be in Scotland, uh, because I, I wouldn't know. You know, I I wouldn't be told about it. Uh, that that would be something that that would be under wraps, as it were. Mm. So. I suppose it would be kept confidential because each case is almost like a medical case, isn't it, Uh, in their eyes anyway? Well, it is. Um, And and certainly uh, psychiatrists who agree to uh, an exorcism or request an exorcism um, because somebody has what they would probably term um, a possession and trance disorder or or words to that effect. Um, and, And... neurologists uh, often they they say that they think it's a neurological condition Um, now uh, who knows I mean my belief is that it is a a negative spirit Um, but their possession is so like many psychological and psychiatric conditions that, again, it comes down to the ability to discern the difference. Mm. Um, and, and that is something that I think would take a lot of experience and training. Um, Alison, what would you say or what would you think would be the difference between, say, um, an episode of psychosis or schizophrenia or multiple personality disorder and something like uh, an actual demonic possession? Well, I'm not a psychiatrist, um, and so it, it, it's very difficult for me to to see and to be able to diagnose somebody as one of those things. And that's why um, when you come across somebody who uh, believes that they're possessed, you would definitely be involved in a, a psychiatrist in uh, what was going on. You you wouldn't be, a, a religious person would not, should not be dealing with it just themselves because mm-hmm. they might be wrong about it. Yeah. Um, so the difference, I, I guess... One of the differences, well, the, well, the, the Catholics have a like what I call a checklist, and you need to fulfil the requirements of this checklist in order to um, be classified as possessed. Um, now, it could be something like speaking in a language that you have never spoke, you don't know. Yeah. Um, uh, quite often, people mention Latin as being one of these languages um, or they might uh, have what you what you might determine as superhuman strength uh, just un, uncharacteristically strong uh, 
or they, there may be paranormal things going on in the room, things moving about. Um, so various, various things like that. Uh, they might levitate uh, or do something else extraordinary, or they might also know information that they wouldn't normally know uh, about the person who's conducting the exorcism or about other people who are who are in the room uh, and and these are these are items to, to look out for and uh, usually uh, if, if uh, maybe three or more are checked on that list I would say that you you may be looking at a genuine case of possession so so ge genuinely kind of paranormal um activity i suppose you could call it yeah yeah you would you would be looking for that i mean this is a it's a a supernatural a a, a, a spiritual disease mm. uh, that's happening and uh, so uh, uh you know you will notice these uh, paranormal occurrences around about the person if it's a genuine case of possession have you ever looked into the Enfield case? You probably have, I should imagine. Um, I've not looked into it. I mean, I know about it, um, but I've not looked into it. But um, now, was that the the film that was made, the the Conjuring Two? Mm. I think that was about the Enfield case. Yeah, yeah. It was. I, I don't think it was. It's kind of very loosely based. Um, uh -huh. I mean, I, did you see it, Neil? The the uh, the Conjuring Two. No, I'm not a great watcher of TV, even though I work in broadcast TV myself, <laughs> or, or the cinema. I'm mostly Netflix, but um... well, it was very, it was very kind of um, well, it's Hollywoodified. If that's yeah, what I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say yeah. it. <laughs> um, and they 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 kind of brought in other things. At one at one point, I think they brought in a weird Slender Man type apparition. That's right. Or oh, that yeah. was really freaky. <laughs> Which was nothing to do with the Enfield case. Whatsoever. No, no. Um, yeah, I mean, what I was going to say there is the um, apparently the the young girl, I forget her name, um, did have a full psychiatric evaluation and was given a hundred percent clean bill of health with that. Um, so that so then the the next two pos uh, possibilities are either it is um, a possession or it's um, controversially high jinks and pranks and um, a, a big hoax. And I think that that particular case is has been controversial since the 1970s when it happened. Um, and there's still some people that absolutely believe it did happen. Uh, for instance, uh, police officers that um, saw things and uh, experienced things, uh, journalists, photographers, that experience things. Um, Harry Price, uh, not Harry, who am I thinking of? Not Harry Price. Uh, on the tip of my tongue, he's got a big moustache. Uh, yeah. Guy um, Lion Playfair? Oh, no. Oh, what's his yeah. name? Morris. Harry Morris Gross. That's the one, not Harry that, Price. Morris yeah, Price. uh -huh, that's Harry true. Price was um, Borley Rectory. Um, right. Yeah, Morris Gross. Uh, and, and these people all, all swear blind that they've had. Uh, weird things happen at them, including Lego bricks thrown at them, seeing levitation, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. Um, and yet, you know, there are some people who who absolutely think that it's a complete fraud. Um, there was the case that the girls were caught doing bangings right. and doing kind of uh, hijinks things, which mm -hmm. didn't help the case. But obviously, girls being girls, especially young ones, um, probably thought it was ever so funny having people round and winding them up. Um, and yet you've got this case where one of the things they, they did um, with this alleged ghost bill coming through is that they filled her mouth with water. The, the, the girl kind of like apparently channeled the voice of this bill. Mm -hmm. And to test it, they, they filled her mouth with water and put tape over. So there's no way that she could fake it. And apparently it still happened. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very strange one um, and quite a disturbing one, actually, because apparently what wasn't um, hugely reported at the time, I don't think, was that it wasn't just this bill she was channeling. She was, there, was, there were multitudes of different spirits that were kind of coming through her. Um, it's a strange <laughs> It's a strange one, and you, and you got to wonder, kind of like where it's coming from. Is it really spiritual kind of souls communicating? Is it something darker? And, and if so, what's the purpose? Um, so I, I guess that's going to be my next question, Alison. What do you think is the purpose of these demonic entities or spirits doing this um, to people? 
Well, as a religious person myself, my belief would be that it is that they want your soul. Mm. That that is why uh, they they try to take over and also i mean it's maybe not necessarily something demonic but if if it was a a spirit an unhappy spirit they were unhappy that they didn't have a body anymore then they might want to come into your body and use your body to do certain things that they would have done themselves in life and that could be um to uh, do something bad uh, and and I've often wondered this about certain criminals, you know, is it really them or is there something with them that's, uh, you know, made them do that? Uh, well, well, this and, is, well, this actually, Alison, I don't know if you've looked into the serial killer cases. Mm. Apparently a lot of the serial killers talk about the voices in their head telling them to do things, mm-hmm. which again, could it be schizophrenia or could it be um, demonic influence? That's uh, right. The son, son of Sam, that one, mm. um, he said that it was the uh, the neighbor's dog was Satan and was <laughs> giving him instructions and in, and in what to do. Mm. Uh, I, I'm not going to say anything either way because I don't really know. I don't know the case. I've not mm. investigated anything about it, uh, so I'm not going to say what I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, anything like that could be schizophrenia uh, but you know it, it still is there in the back of my mind that you know when when i see some cases and i think wow that that was pure evil where did that evil come from mm. um what, what was the source of it and was that something uh from outside the person uh, influencing them mm. these and- are possibilities and even if we take the kind of like the stance, stance um, and it is a classical stance that, OK, these these demonic realms, these kind of uh, devil beings, they want your soul. The next question I would ask is, well, for what purpose? What are you gonna, OK, let's say you've got a soul, stick it in a spiritual jam jar. What are you going to do with it? I mean, what is the point? Where Where is it leading? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where, we don't, um, imagine you're imagine you're like a demonic being on a big throne in hell with fire all over the place, and you've got these souls. Well, well, what are you going to use them for? What are you going to do with them? Well, they, it takes it takes the the person's soul away from God, and that's their that that's their um, primary purpose mm. um, is is so that you are not with God, um, mm. and. Uh, it's an insecurity again, thing. <laughs> it's what? what? An insecurity thing. Yeah. How do you mean? Well, like, you know, if you, if you go back to the playground at school, there'd always be a bully who will try and control other kids. Mm. And it, generally, psychologists would say, oh, it, it's an insecurity thing. They're doing it because they want to beef themselves up to be bigger uh, and they're actually quite frightened on the inside. So mm. when p- people are trying to control you, it's more often than not, it's because they, they, they fear that they haven't got control over anything or they're not mm. good enough or something. And I think those traits still carry across into the spirit world. Mm-hmm. And uh, and maybe, um, you know, you're feeling a bit lost over there because you did not believe in a spirit world. And I, I, my understanding is that it's actually a lot easier to cross over to a spirit world when you've got a belief in it or an understanding to a certain extent you can adapt to it a lot more but when you're a diehard skeptic who resists any form of afterlife or paranormal or anything like that when you finally die and you find yourself out of the body you're confused as hell but because of your limitations of your belief you deny that such a thing can exist so Mm. therefore you go to the nearest source of communication which happens to be the earth realm because you're probably Mm. more likely stuck there Mm -hmm. and so therefore you're trying to influence people to communicate with you or control them in some way to get a message through i don't think it's always there necessarily evil i think it's a frustration on their part that Mm -hmm. they've realized that something's gone wrong, mm. i.e. they've died, but they don't know what, and they need to try and reach out to people. And they can somehow influence matter because they're closer to it in this realm mm-hmm. uh, than, say, a spirit of our lovely aunt or uncle or parents or whoever are in the spirit world who can't influence this matter as much because they're not on the same wavelength, if you see mm-hmm. what I mean. Absolutely. I think that's an, an excellent point that you've made there. Um, and I, I think that um, some 
cases of possession uh, might not necessarily be, as you say, like negative. Uh, people have been uh, possessed. It does come across as being a, a negative word, but um, there have been cases where people have uh, started doing artwork um, that they they didn't know anything about art. Uh, and also uh, mediumship, uh, you know, physical mediumship, uh, where a, a, a spirit speaks through a medium. I mean, that's kind of a form of possession, you might say. But um, the, the medium has the ability to send that, that spirit back um, and, and let go of that spirit. So that, I mean, to me, that's a form of, of possession, temporary yeah. possession. Yeah, there, there, there's invited uh, into my home, come into my mm. home for a nice cup of tea invite, but there's also mm. breaking and entering. So they yes. both actually have the same end result. They're both inside yeah. the home. But one's yeah. with permission and one isn't. Uh, yeah. and, and so, yeah, there's there's different ways of approaching it. Mm -hmm. But getting back to the Enfield poltergeist, um, Andy said that uh, they, they tested this girl with water in her mouth and, and yet still the voice was heard. Now, that reminded me when he said that, that um, it was very much like uh, the medium Leslie Flint, who was a voice medium who apparently had voices appear in the room and they had taped him up and put water in his mouth or fluids in his mouth to ensure that it wasn't him producing the voices by throwing his voice. So it makes me wonder if the girl in the Enfield Poltergeist case was actually a similar kind of medium mm -hmm. to Leslie Flynn, but maybe was misinterpreted mm -hmm. or she had a bit of an open door policy, i.e. she didn't really know quite what was happening and all sorts of voices were coming through, good and bad and all sorts. Because, I mean, when Leslie Flint started out, he would find himself watching a film in a cinema and in the darkness, people would complain saying, stop all that talking back there. But apparently it's all these voices manifesting mm. around him in the darkness because it's similar <laughs> to a seance room, you see? Wow, yeah. Uh-huh. That's, yeah, that's absolutely excellent, that point as well. Um, so I don't, you, there was... I was going to say, you said you're ordained or something, is that right? Or you're... Um, or, um, I'm a deacon, a deacon, uh, with, yeah, right. Uh -huh. So um, now, I, I when when I saw that on Facebook, you'd become a deacon, and I put a little like to it. I was I was a little bit confused because I remember you saying that you you met me at Witchfest. Uh, mm -hmm. For those that don't know, it's like a witchcraft uh, Wicca kind of event, uh, and this one was in Glasgow, I believe, wasn't it? That's um, right. And I was selling my artwork there. Mm -hmm. um, so would you say that you're you were a witch or a pagan and you suddenly got over to uh, a more christian side of things or you you or you 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 have both sorts of camps of belief within you yeah i think uh, for me it's uh, both camps um it's it's all uh, for me a, a spiritual journey um i'm not anti anything uh, i i don't call myself a witch uh, I probably prefer the term Gnostic Christian nowadays uh, if I have to stick a label on it. But, um, I mean, that doesn't mean that my, my pagan beliefs have just disappeared, you know, into the ether. Um, they're, they're still there. Uh, I, I did uh, start up Scott Witch, which is an online uh, group. It started the Glasgow University Pagan Society. Um and uh, did like a lot of arranging things for them. And uh, I was also into spiritualism a little bit. Uh, at some point along the way, that wasn't quite enough. I was still looking for something. And um, that's when I encountered, if, if you want to say that, uh, Mary, the Virgin Mary, and um, the angels also made their presence known. And uh, I also started looking into Jesus as a solar deity. And um, I guess seeing seeing Christ in nature and things like that. And uh, asking for these things to make themselves known to me in a way that a pagan would understand. Uh, now... 
for me, the Bible is a lot of allegory and symbolism and a lot of the artwork is the same. And, uh, you know, that that's where I'm at. Um, there's, I mean, there's lots to say about Jesus as a solar deity and um, the... You know, behind the um, behind most paintings, there's a sort of sun. Some people interpret it as a halo, but I interpret it as a sun. Behind uh, angels and saints and and whoever, um, and I got into Gnosticism as well, uh, which can be applied to any religion, and uh, it helps you to understand the symbolism and the mysteries within religion. So you've got things like astrotheology, uh, which I see when it comes to this time of year, I just, you were talking about Christmas before. <laughs> I love Christmas. I really do. And um, astrotheology is something that uh, I'm, I'm very into. And that shows you that um, at, at this time of year, uh, the, the movement of the stars uh, coincides with the Christmas story. Uh, so now let me think. The three the three stars on Orion's belt are also known as uh, the, the three wise men. Mm. And the where they come up in the sky um, is followed by Sirius, the brightest star. Mm. So uh, you know, they, 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 the three wise men are following the star. Well, they're actually preceding the star rather than following it. And then the sun the next morning rises in the same place uh, as, as the reborn sun on Christmas Day. Uh, so as a pagan, I know that on the 21st or the 22nd, the, the longest night, the winter solstice, um that is when you might say the sun dies and then it's four days later reborn on Christmas Day. Now, if you listen to um, the carols, a lot of them talk about this, about the returning light um, and uh, things like that. I can't remember offhand uh, all the, the different Christmas carols. Um uh, there's also something about the solar cross, but I can't remember now. Um, but definitely it's a symbol of enlightenment too, as well as, uh, well, life, giving life and, and healing and things like that are all mentioned. And of course, these are things that the sun does do for us. It does give us life here on earth. Um, it does bring us healing, um, both physically and psychologically. I mean, obviously, you don't want to be out in the sun too long, but um, we, we all need our daily dose of vitamin D. Um, and so it, it would only be right, I think, to um, give thanks to the sun um, as, uh, as something that does this for us. And our nature um, is to personify things if, if we're of a religious or spiritual nature, we, we might personify something. And I think that that's what's happened here. But it, it's also an amalgamation of various different things uh, from various different cultures, from uh, the Egyptian culture comes into it as well, um, uh, and even the, the Greek culture, the ancient mysteries of Eleusis come to mind um, when the... the the um, Dionysus was um, uh, sacrificed, so he represents uh, wine, Bacchus, and um, the goddess of the grain, Demeter. Uh, so you might think of like you know the bread and the wine. Mm. Um, so that that all kind of starts to come into play there, um, and so Dionysus and uh, Who's the other one? Is it Osiris? Because uh, I don't know much about Egyptian uh, mythology, I'm afraid. But um, a lot of uh, sacrificed gods uh, who have the same uh, sort of journey 
if you like, um, and, and are worshipped in a very similar way. But that for me doesn't take anything away from going into a church and um, getting something from a service. It also doesn't take away from me um, the, the knowledge of the historical Jesus and what he did. So that, you know, that's part of my uh, faith too. Um, it, it's not just about the symbolism, but it takes on board the symbolism. So that's kind of where I'm at. Hmm. I mean, this is, have you seen the, uh, the documentary Zeitgeist? I have. It was fantastic. I loved that. I really did. Just destroying religions since 2015. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I thought it was really cool, actually. Um, I sent mm -hmm. that to a few Christian people who hated me for it, um, <laughs> which I thought was very Christian of them. Um, <laughs> Am I thinking of the same uh, documentary? Because the, the one that I'm thinking of was um, more um, political. Uh, I think there's different oh, versions, isn't there? There's, there are different versions. There is uh, the uh, best one, of course, is the first one that goes very much into the religious. There is a second version, which is into nine eleven, I think, and, and the uh, money stuff. Yeah, the money well. system and the political yeah. thing. But the first one certainly talks about what you were talking about, Alison, um, in terms of the Jesus story based on mm -hmm. something like uh, there's quite a few, maybe thirty or so um, mm -hmm. different. Uh, religious uh, kind of people and deities within different mm -hmm. cultures. So Mithra in the in the Roman culture, yeah. uh, Horus in the Egyptian culture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, mm -hmm. but see, you know, some people might use that to say, see, it's you know, you've stolen from that culture and, and whatever. But I just think it for me, it, it adds something else to it. It doesn't detract from it, and. Um, you know, I don't think it's Christianity itself that is um, really the to to blame for um, other things. You know, for for the way that uh, some Christians have behaved in the past and the present, um, it, it's it's a completely separate thing. You know, I mean, there was the oh, what do you call it, the Spanish Inquisition and the the witch trials and all that kind of stuff. Um, that that's got nothing to do with uh, Jesus Christ or Christian um, or you know the Christian faith. That was to do with people at that time and in that culture um, doing what they thought was right. Um, at, at times, it, it was primarily things like, um, "What have we done to suffer the, the, <laughs> this plague? Um, we must do. We must do better." Um, who's put a curse on us for X, Y, and Z? And they lived in this sort of very paranoid culture. Now that had nothing to do with Christianity. So um, for me, uh, none of none of what I've said takes away from from how I feel about it and how I feel about um, you know the spiritual side of uh, life and of of the teachings of Christianity. I think there's a lot to be learned there, and I'm saying that as a pagan too because um, I'm still could um, go and commune with nature and, uh, you know, the, uh, the outside can be, uh, you know, my church as well doesn't have to be inside, but at the same time, churches can be beautiful places. And um, I really started to have a love of them when I went into churches in Italy um, these sort of big Catholic churches mm. uh, and lots of marble and, and lots of artwork and uh, it just it began to feel like your your soul was being fed by all this imagery and all these surroundings mm. um, and and elevating you know your consciousness uh, mm. so right okay that's that's interesting right i think we've got to take a break now uh okay. in the paranormal peep show but we're talking to alison dunlop of the adx files who is also a co-presenter here on the paranormal uk radio network so uh alison we shall be carrying on with this wonderful conversation we obviously want to go more into other paranormal subjects after the break uh, and we'll catch you in just a second see you in a bit well Here's the President, returning from his trip through the Black Hole. How did you pass the time, sir? Listening to the Paranormal UK Radio. 
Well, it's marvellous seeing a small trump emerging from the mighty black hole. Ooh, come in, come in. Sit down, relax, and enjoy the show. Welcome back to part two of the Paranormal Peep Show with myself, Neil Geddes Ward, and Andy Chaplin. And we're talking to Alison Dunlop, who is a co host here on the Paranormal UK Radio Network, and she presents the ADX Files. Alison, welcome back. Thank you. So, Alison, uh, you have done a whole host of things as well as being a radio presenter. You've been a deacon in churches. You're also a pagan uh, and you've talked about um, possession and things like that. Now, obviously, that's connected with spiritualism, I presume, in a kind of roundabout way. Uh, You've got psychic powers yourself. Would that be correct? Well, I think everybody's got psychic abilities. Um, I do go to a development circle, um, which is run by my fiancé, Ian Shanes, and uh, that's helped me to uh, connect and and communicate with spirit, and um, especially in places where perhaps there's a problem, it's very helpful. I think to to have that uh, ability to communicate with uh, anything that might be there. So uh, I go along to that. Uh, there's there's two. It's on twice a month. So at the moment it's the second Tuesday and the uh, fourth Wednesday, um, and uh, I get a lot out of doing that. And and what sort of procedures do you do? I mean, uh, I, I've been in psychic developing circles and. Uh, and Andy's been in them. And the, uh, does it follow the same sort of thing where you do meditation and then you try and do readings on each other? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes. Um, it's primarily you're working on yourself and developing yourself and your personality. And um, so it is, starts off with meditation. Uh, you you might be partnered with somebody to um, do some 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 mediumship with them, or um, more often it's uh, healing that we'll do. Um, and I do uh, healing, spiritual and uh, reiki, and uh, so that is helpful uh, for the development circle. And that that's pretty much uh, what we do. Uh, the meditation will just stick on some music and. Uh, go into it. it's not guided or anything like that it's very much like what comes to you what is it that you need to see um, and and who are your guides uh, so nothing is fed to the person uh, it's just what they get and it's the practice of that over time that awareness becoming aware of of what is surrounding you because it's a you know it, as we are and attached to the material world, the spiritual world has become invisible. Mm. So it's about helping people to see the two sides of, um, you know, the world. And have you had a chance to put that in practice into public uh, areas yet? I have, yeah. Um, a couple of times um, I've, I, I had a visit, uh, I was called to a haunted club, a private club in Ayrshire. And uh, I wasn't told anything about it. Uh, but when I went in, the the first thing was I thought somebody, we were standing talking with the, the person who had let us in. And uh, the first thing was I thought that somebody had come in the, the door and I'd heard the the floorboards creaking like somebody had walked through the, the hallway. I was standing right there and I turned around to see who it was and, you know, there was nobody there. Um, we went upstairs and on the top floor I heard... Uh, like two tuts, you know, like that. And I thought, was that a tut or is there a clock up here ticking? Um, but there wasn't. Uh, so we we separated into, uh, you know, uh, either one or two going off on their own. And I wanted to do it on my own. I, I prefer silence and just to tune in. And it can take me a little while. 
It's not always immediate. But I went up the stairs and this old woman came rushing forward and told me to get out. She was, get out, get out, get out. And I just communicated with her and you communicate telepathically. Um, did, she look, okay. did she look solid or did she look translucent or how did it look? Um, well, you see these things, I guess, it's in your mind's eye. So you, as, mm. as a medium, you see them as a, you, um, you see most of them like, you know, a solid figure, but in your mind's eye. And, I, you know, I just said to her, it's OK, I'm just having a look around. I hope you don't mind. And she said, uh, this is my house. I said, oh, you've got a lovely house and just sort of humoured her and um, cajoled her, you know, and and uh, said, uh, you know, people enjoy looking around your house and um, you've not to be frightened of them if they if they come up and uh, all the rest of it, you know, had this conversation with her. Now, when I told the events manager this, uh, she was astonished because one of the workers uh, about f two months before had come running down the stairs and said to her, could she go up and finish whatever it was she was doing? And the events manager said, why? And she said, because there's an old woman up there and she's telling me to get out. So that was probably the first time I've ever had real confirmation of something that I've picked up on. And uh, so that was a real sort of boost to my confidence doing this kind of stuff. Um, and I, I'd come downstairs into, they have this small museum and I was in this small museum and there was, um, it's, it's, a, it's an Air Force place. So there was somebody who was quite high up in the Air Force. Um, I, I, I don't know the, the various different terms for... Um, whether you know you get an army colonel and all these kind of things so whatever he was he was quite high up and he walked around with me and uh, before I was going out he said uh, he gave me some names and he said watch out for the old woman up the stairs <laughs> I said I know I've met her um, but he, he was dressed um, when I described the clothes that he was wearing one of the staff had seen um, the the bottom like his trousers and his shoes in the mirror uh, underneath the bar I think it was or behind the bar um, now somebody else in there had seen a, a, la a solid not in their, their mind's eye uh, a, a lady dressed in white um, but it was like uh, like 1970s type trousers and she was dressed all in white and they blinked uh, like hard blink and when they opened their eyes again she was gone and she was on the dance floor so I'd gone into the to the uh, dance hall it's quite a big hall and sat on the stage because uh, I'd, I'd been all around it and so I thought I sat on the stage closed my eyes and nothing was happening nothing and I said well you know I'm here it's your chance to uh, come forward and give me information, show yourself in some way, but you're not showing yourself just now. I can't, I'm not picking up anything. And uh, just at that, all the, the windows, there's these big glass windows down one side of the room, um, they all began to shake. Um, they all began to tremble. Uh, in a way that I would have been surprised if it was a lorry outside, but I did ask um, the, the the manageress um, and the, the bar staff um, and the president had this, was this something that happened regularly, uh, traffic outside perhaps, and they said no, they had never witnessed anything like this. So um, that was that was something else. Um, that I was given proof with but uh, so I, I've had a few things I've um, I've seen a, a negative entity in a hospital who was trying to get it seemed to me uh, an old lady who was extremely ill in the next room and uh, you know it, it was the point where her family were outside and uh, extremely upset and told you know that she 
probably wasn't going to make the night. And uh, so they were in sitting with her taking turns and uh, this dark shadow that I'd seen started moving towards her. And um, I called upon the angels, Michael and um, Raphael, to give her strength and protection and healing and surround her bed with healing angels and the negative and I told the this spirit to leave and it did it started moving back and the next day the woman had had some kind of miraculous healing that that she was uh, she was doing really well and well enough to be moved to a room on um, to a ward so uh, that was that was another thing that that happened um, so you what on earth was going on there because i mean mm, presumably she wasn't a bad woman she wasn't a, a bad person so why is why a darkness you know being attracted to her well, I think the fact that she was um perhaps old and frail and ill and vulnerable and um, people in hospitals are obviously vulnerable because they're sick and um the one of the nurses had uh, come in and I didn't tell her what I'd seen because I didn't really want locked up you know, so, so I, I kept that to myself but I asked her uh, I told her what I was into with the radio show and all that kind of stuff and I said um, I bet you see lots of things in hospitals and she said yeah there's something out there and she pointed to where this dark shadow had I had seen it mm. and uh, she said last week an old man woke up he, you know he was screaming and when they ran in he said somebody was pulling him out of the bed by his feet and uh, they so gave him a they, did they say sorry to stop you did they say oh. something or someone I think they said something, actually, mm. when I think about it. But it, it's quite a while ago now, and I can't be 100% sure about that. But, uh, you know, he obviously didn't see anything, so he might have said something's pulling me out of the bed. Um, and so they calmed him down, gave him a cup of tea, calmed him down, and he went back to sleep. And a nurse was in putting something in a cupboard and she just felt this invisible hand go clamping over her arm and she ran out of there like she was Sebastian Coe you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I can well imagine um so that whether or not I had but I believe that I had picked up on something there and uh, another thing that happened uh, was I didn't realise at first that I was dreaming, uh, but I, I was in my my mum's old house and she was standing with me, and I saw somebody coming up the stairs and I thought I know that face, mm. and when they came in the room, it was my mum's best friend who had died, um maybe about six months or maybe even a year before. And I thought, she can't be here. Hmm. And I turned to my mum and I said, I think this is a dream, but we'll just go with it, okay? <laughs> and, and she's like, oh, uh, okay. And so we walked around with this lady. At, and At this point in time, was your mum alive? Yes, yeah, she is. She's still alive. Okay. Um, so we walked around with this lady and uh, she was not happy about being dead. She, this is not what was supposed to happen and uh, she was quite annoyed and things were not the way that she had thought they should be um now she had she had died because she she fell downstairs um and hit her head and that was how she died um so it was a an unexpected uh, very quick death um after my second kidney transplant she appeared in the room now I saw her quite clearly mm. and she it seemed to me had been given a job to do now this would have been important to this lady uh, she was she had been a, a an auxiliary nurse she um was a, 
a very active Christian in a church and was very used to helping people. And so it seemed to me that she had been given a job that may well have been in a hospital. And uh, she she had this clipboard and she said, everything's fine. Um, I'm fine. Uh you know, da da da. The, you know, so it, it seemed to me that she was a lot happier and contented with the way that things had worked out for her, um, and the way probably that things had worked out for for me with the with the operation. Um, uh, so that that was that was another thing that I saw, and I saw that that was that was quite a clear image. Not in I wouldn't have said in my mind's eye, or if it was, it was in that kind of. In between, I mean, obviously, I just had this big operation. I was on medication, um, and and when I was in hospital before, I was quite ill at the time. So people might say that, or oh, you just you were just on, you know, you just had lots of drugs, or you just were seriously ill, or whatever. But you know, when you're in that place that's maybe a bit closer to death than than other people. Mm. I think you are more likely to see such things. You are more likely to see through that veil into the other world. It becomes much right. clearer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, these these, uh, these kinds of places, especially where humans congregate and there's, there's vast uh, emotions and things going on, obviously like a, a hospital would be... Mm there would be a lot of deaths. There would be a lot of people towards the end of their lives. There would be yeah. a lot of grief with the, with the families coming to visit, etc. cetera. Um, and this is where a lot of paranormal stuff does tend to happen. Absolutely. Uh, where humans congregate, isn't it? Mm, I think so. Yeah. I mean, I, I've done a lot of talks on this area of hospitals and hauntings. And, and as Andy says that, you know, you're, you're more likely to find spirits lurking around hospitals than actually graveyards, uh, in mm. my opinion, mm -hmm. simply yeah. because that's where people are freshly passing over. They're freshly confused. Um, they're perhaps trying to okay. re-enter their body, which they've literally only left a few minutes ago. They're not likely to try and re-enter their body if they're hanging around in a graveyard and their body has been, uh, say, at the uh, mortuary for about two weeks and then in the ground. Mm. Um, I think that's uh, the, 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 the living's viewpoint of where the dead should be because for them, that's the, where the dead end up in the ground. So therefore, the okay. spirits will be coming out of those corpses you know, at midnight or something stupid like that. Mm. Whereas the reports, the evidence seems to come in that a lot of these sightings from nurses and, and mm -hmm. other patients and uh, auxiliary workers and ambulance people all seem to suggest that, you know, they've seen lots of different, you know, apparitions or, or deceased patients and things like that. I mean, I was actually told this a few years ago, and whether this is true to all nurses and doctors in the UK, but this particular nurse that I had heard about was doing training. And apparently the, the latest, and this was probably about nine years ago then, uh, the latest training for nurses at that point in this particular hospital was that if they find they've got a spirit attachment to themselves when they go home after a shift, they have to go back to the hospital to have it dealt with in some way. Never was explained to me what that dealing with in some way was, but it's obviously become such an issue that these nurses, when they, come, you, they yeah, go, are you saying this is like a this is like official training documents? Well, saying? this this is what I haven't actually gathered, but apparently this nurse that was going through training, it was relayed back to me. She she was told this as part of her training. Now, as I say, this was just one particular hospital, um, but I know that nurses train at different hospitals for different things. So mm. my guess is that, it, I mean, it'd be great if there's any people that do work in hospitals can enlighten us on, you know, the official viewpoint of nurses training, if mm. you want to write in and tell us. Um, but, but my understanding was that, that nurses and doctors, maybe more nurses, uh, are trained to have to deal with this sort of thing because it's become such an issue that mm. people are dying left, right and centre in hospitals, as you'd expect. Uh, it comes as no surprise. But obviously when the dead pass over, the spirit passes out of the body, a great deal of them uh, are confused about what's happened. But mm. also, if you actually think about it, you know, when you're in hospital, the first person you go to when you're not well is the nurse. Oh, nurse, mm -hmm. I have a drink of water. So, of course, yeah. when you're out your body... 
who do you go to? You go to the nurse again. <laughs> so yeah. it becomes an, an attachment and they follow them home. And of course, the, the spirit doesn't realize they're dead, but they're obviously hanging around the nurse in, in some sort of, you know, trying to get some answers to why are they feeling a bit strange or why is everybody else ignoring them or something like that. And obviously nurses, I think, tend to be probably slightly more clairvoyant than, than the average person because they're much more sympathetic and caring. And mm-hmm. maybe that opens up a bit of a clair buoyant sort of sensitivity about them um, possibly possibly i mean my mum was an auxiliary nurse and uh, she's one of these i don't really believe this sort of stuff it's interesting um but my mum is one of the most psychic people that i know and uh, she just doesn't realize it or, or want <laughs> it to be the case go, and she's, yeah. she is really quite if she if she went to a development circle, I think she would do far better than me. Mm. Um, she she really is very, very psychic. Um, I think the what would probably happen would be some kind of form of uh, counselling for um, anyone who thought that they had taken an attachment home with them. And that might come from their supervisors or it might come from the hospital chaplain for example who would no doubt have um, plenty of experience in such matters Uh, I don't think that my mum ever mentioned anything like that I I doubt it but uh, I have to tell you um, it's not really a funny story it wasn't funny at the time but uh, I briefly worked as an auxiliary nurse uh, just for three months and uh, on this occasion I'd taken this uh, lady she wasn't feeling very well she'd been kind of grumpy uh, all day and I'd taken her down to the toilet I was waiting outside for her and I heard her saying I don't feel very well so I went in and I crouched down in front of her and I said are you okay and she tipped over and died on top of me oh my god so, yeah <laughs> Hmm. I wasn't I wasn't an auxiliary nurse for very long after that. No, I um, see why. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um I I don't think I didn't really experience any, you know, um attachment of anything like that. So uh, I I don't really know, you know, about that. Um, Neil, remind the, me um, what the advice was if you, if you if a nurse did get an attachment. What did they say? That um, they do? Well, basically, uh, as I remember it, it was a, if a nurse comes home after the shift uh, and they're at home and they feel there's a spirit around them in some way, they they've got to return to the hospital uh, pronto, pretty much straight away. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, jump on the bus, taxi, whatever car. Yeah, get back to the hospital, and after that, it becomes a little bit of a grey area. I wasn't quite sure. What happens? I presume you report back to your supervisor, and mm-hmm. then they maybe talk to the the chaplain at the hospital or someone mm-hmm. who is um, good at dealing with it. Maybe yeah. they've got an unofficial spiritualist looking around the corner or something. I don't know. Don't know. Wow. Could, could be. Well, I mean, Ian, uh, he always says to people, if you feel different before you leave this circle, don't leave. Mm. And you know, if it's the, when they get home, they have to contact them and say to them that that they feel um, that they might have something. They've taken something with them, but he always advises never leave a circle mm. uh, if you feel uh, that you have picked up something. Well, mm. that definitely. Uh, I mean, I'd be in the circle. I'd go home and I'd say, I feel like a nurse. Just, you definitely left the wrong person. Yeah. <laughs> now, an interesting story. As we're on the subject of nurses, um, my brother, my older brother, uh, is married to a lady who's got kids from a previous um, marriage, and they're growing up now. But um, I forget which one it is, and I won't say their names. But I think it was the oldest one has started a job as a nurse. So she's a student nurse, and she's working at a hospital in Exeter or somewhere in Devon anyway. And um, she was on the night shift apparently. And one of the patients asked her if it's possible to get some extra pillows um, to make her more comfortable for sleeping. So, you know, this young girl said, yeah, sure. I'll go and get them for you. So she went to this room where they store all the pillows and blankets in this cupboard. Now in the very same room, there is also a hospital bed that's already pre-made up so that if they need to put another patient in, 
in that bed, they can do so and it's all prepared. So the room is full of pillows and things in the cupboard and right beside it is this bed that's all nicely, neatly made up. So this girl goes to the cupboard, she opens the cupboard doors, starts getting the pillows out, then she shuts the cupboard doors and the bed has been whisked to the other end of the room and all the blankets have been thrown off it and there's no (laughs) one else in the room. Wow. Yeah. Spooky (laughs) indeed, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's my, an angry brother, spirit. my brother told me that and he's not he, he, he doesn't believe in this sort of stuff but he told me that <laughs> wow yeah. very interesting yeah very interesting. And, and, and then uh, the paranormal group uh, we did have a guy I don't know if he was there Andy on this particular occasion but this guy and his girlfriend they're the ghost hunters is the term and they were doing research on, on various paranormal stuff but his day job or evening job depending on what shift he was on he was an RAC repairman, and he said that uh, the RAC has a contract to go and repair or pick up ambulances that are broken down. Uh, now, he said that he's allowed to as part of his job. If there's an ambulance that's damaged in some way, but it's not safe to drive, but it's still drivable, he's allowed to drive it back to the depot to get repaired. So on this particular occasion, he was called to go and pick up an ambulance at a you know, something wrong with it. It wasn't safe to drive for the ambulance drivers, but he would take the risk and actually drive it. So he got in the ambulance by himself, buckled up, adjusted the mirror, and lo and behold, he saw a person in the back of the ambulance via the mirror uh, and who was sitting in there. And it appeared to be a patient that had died, but they were still sitting there looking at him. And he was freaked out by it. So although he was a ghost hunter and he's used to ghosts and spirits and things like that, it freaked him out slightly because he was in there by himself. He rang his girlfriend up, who was his fellow ghost hunter, and he said, oh my God, there's a blooming patient sitting in the back here, a ghost of a patient sitting in the back of the ambulance. What am I, What do I do? And she shouted down the phone, well, talk to them. Talk to mm-hmm. them, say, hello, how are you? Or something like that, you know. Mm. He goes, no, he says, I can do it if you were with me, but I can't do it right now by myself. Aww. So what he did was he turned the mirror the other way so he wouldn't see the reflection and it put him off. And he didn't want to look in the back. He just had to drive the ambulance all the way to repair that to get it sorted. But, oh, um, my God. It, it seems, you know, again, uh, an ambulance is like a mini hospital, if you like. It's mm-hmm. on four wheels. It's got all that medical equipment in there. And people sometimes pass over before they get to hospital and they're, yeah. they're going to die they the will. ambulance, you see? Yeah. And mm-hmm. so, again, they're... they're Either that's their last impression, psychic impression they created in the ambulance, and mm-hmm. the spirit has moved on, and mm-hmm. but they create that like snapshot photograph image of themselves, or they are actually lurking around in that ambulance for whatever reason. Don't know. Yeah, and it would be best to uh, try to guide them over to the other side in that situation. You don't want to spend your your eternity in an ambulance. Well, no, until the next psychic yes. medium comes along. Yeah, especially if Boris Johnson's selling it on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, there is another ambulance story, I think, and then we can leave it and move on to other stuff. But an ambulance story, a um, hospital story. Again, this was told to me by a nurse. Um, it's not something I read in a book. It's a real person that told me this. And um, this girl, again, she said, now, I don't normally talk about this sort of stuff, but it's only because you're, meaning me, talking about ghost stuff to her, Um, because it was all gathered around a sort of summer camp fireside, and I was telling the ghost stories, of course, Uh, and and it prompted her to tell her story. And she said, I work in a hospital on the South Coast, and I I didn't ask which one, but I kind of guessed that it could be Southampton Hospital. And um, she said, now, I know this to be true, because I spoke to the doctors that it happened to, and she said, in this hospital, there is a certain floor, and I'll say the third floor, because I don't know which, I'll say the third floor, where all the seriously ill patients are, are on these uh, you know, heart monitors and machines and all sorts of things to keep them ticking over, as it were, but they're being closely monitored by these machinery. And if one of them flatlines or has a heart attack or crashes, it sets off an alarm on a pager of the doctors who are up on the fourth floor. And so as soon as someone flatlines, their pager goes off, and rather than take the lift, because it takes extra time for the lift to come up and down the thing, it's just easier to run down the flights of stairs, a couple of flights of stairs, and in and into the third floor, and there you are, 
and say, right, where's this patient that's uh, died or whatever? We're going to try and resuscitate them. And of course, what happened was their pager went off. So a doctor and two medics rush down the stairs. They're rushing down the first set of stairs and they get to the second set of stairs and they see this girl sitting on the stairs and they go to her, what are you doing here? And all this girl could say is, my stomach really hurts. My stomach really hurts. And they said, well, look, stay here. We can't do anything to help you because we've got to go and see someone, but we'll send someone up to you, okay? And they rush on down into the third, uh, fourth floor or third floor, where it is, where all these patients are. They go to uh, resuscitate this patient that's died on the um, table. And it's the same patient that they've just seen in the stairwell. Oh my god. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So basically she had died, floated out of her body, somehow became trapped um in the stairs, mm-hmm. uh, and she was in agony. Now mm-hmm. I told this story to my mum, uh, and my mum said, Well, why would she be in agony if she's just if she's just died? And I said, Well, I think that her astral cord, if you like, well, that's the part that connects the spirit body to the physical body has snapped. And because she's still operating to a certain extent within our world, because she was seen by the doctors and was heard to speak, therefore she's resonating at our frequency to a certain extent, I think her soul or spirit is still feeling the pain of this world to a certain mm. extent. And because that is like an umbilical cord being snapped or pulled, it was causing her a lot of pain. But I think that once she resonates up to the spirit world, a different frequency, that pain would soon vanish. Uh, And of course, when they came back, she had gone. She wasn't there, you see. So she'd been taken. So yeah, interesting stories. And I think it happens on a weekly basis. Mm. uh, So again, if you're a nurse, doctor, medical worker or anything, and you want to write to us uh, and tell us about your ghost stories in hospitals, we'd love to hear it. Uh, Maybe you'd like to come on as a guest. We'd love to hear that as well. Just contact us on our Facebook page, which is a Paranormal Peep Show on uh, Facebook, and, and leave us a message. We'd love to hear from you. I also so, think, Neil, maybe we should open up to to all um, uh, uh, services um, because there's there was a show on Sky called Paranormal Nine One One. Obviously, Nine One One meaning the uh, the the code for emergency services in America. Yep, yep. Over in England, it's nine nine nine. Obviously, um, but there were a lot of stories in America about police officers, fire officers, paramedics, um, all sorts of en- encountered really strange paranormal stories. Um, and we'd definitely love to hear it from um, you know, let's call it Paranormal Nine 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 in a UK based um, yeah. uh, fire service police, paramedics, ambulance drivers, uh, surgeons even, you know, any kind of paranormal stories uh, from the services would be really interesting. Even even actually could expand it to the armed forces um, because I personally know some people um, who are in the armed forces or have been in the armed forces who have also experienced some very odd things going on. Um, RAF stations and um, army bases, army barracks. Um, so, yeah, we'd love to hear love to hear those kind of things oh cool now uh, moving on then thank you for that Andy moving on um, Alison you are in the SPI is that correct yes strange phenomena investigations I've been um, I was I, I was a member back in the mid 90s and then I went off and you know did the pagan society stuff and then I, I came back and got back in touch with Malcolm he was down in England by this time and uh, he gave me his blessing to carry on with SPI in Scotland so I named it SPI Scotland and uh, started up a group and then we we did we do conferences now once a year um, and all that's going really well uh, so that's that's SPI Okay, and um, now Malcolm is Malcolm Robinson, and, and mm-hmm. regular listeners of the Paranormal UK Radio Network might remember his name because he's appeared on quite a few shows on the network, and uh, you, you've known Malcolm quite a few years, I gather, then. So mm-hmm. yeah. um, he recently did a tour, didn't he, to do with uh, UFOs and things? He, he did because it was the 40-year anniversary of Strange Phenomena Investigations, and uh, that was born out of the Bob Taylor incident in 1979. Uh, 9th of November, I think I'm right in saying there. Uh, it, was, it was the 40th birthday of uh, SPI so he gave a a fantastic talk uh, on this subject and uh, it it was standing room only in fact we had to 
turn a few people away from that event. Um, and uh, he he gave all the evidence, everything that there was to know about it, some things that I didn't know. Um, I wish I'd taken notes, actually, but there, there will be a, a video. Uh, it was videoed, so um, I don't know where that will be uploaded or if it will be available to buy. I'm not quite sure what's happening there. But uh, it, it was a fantastic talk uh, all about this incident, um, which, if you want, I'll, I'll relate to you. If you want Absolutely. To. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, I know the story roughly, but okay. the listeners, obviously, they you know, don't know about the Bob Taylor incident. I'm sure they'd love to hear it. Okay. Mm. So Bob Taylor was a forestry worker in uh, the Livingston area. And he was out one day with his dog uh, walking through the forest, checking. Um, I believe he was checking that like, there was a field that sometimes sheep would come through. But whatever he was checking, he, he came down and uh, he saw this uh, object and it kept on appearing and disappearing. Uh, it, it was sort of dome shaped with a flange around uh, the bottom of it. Um, and I think now there's been uh, there's been various versions of exactly what it looked like. But uh, anyway, so he's looking at this and in amazement, and these two um, other uh, things dropped from the bottom of it. And they were kind of like um, the world was it World War Two bombers with the spikes, um, uh, uh, war mines, sea mines. Well, but, yeah, uh -huh, yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. Um, and they rolled towards him, and he he smelled this. Uh, I think it was like a chemical or a, an electrical smell or something like that. And uh, the. They, they tugged on his uh, trousers um, and ripped them at the pockets. Uh, he passed out and when he came to, he his car wouldn't start. He had to crawl however many miles just about to get home. He was in quite some state. He was, you know, scratched and bruised and all the rest of it. And... Um, when he got there and his wife asked him what on earth had happened to him, he said that he had been attacked by a UFO. She immediately call, uh, called his uh, manager who came round. She called the doctor who also came round to check him over. They then called the police um, he was not somebody who made up stories. He was in a state. Um, they wanted to, to to check that he was okay. He was taken to hospital. They did tests. Uh, there was nothing showed up, like no epileptic fit, no um, brain lesions or tumours or anything like that. Nothing showed up. And um, the police investigated it. Uh, as um, an attack, an assault by person or persons unknown. And that was how it was termed. Now, I I get I I don't know if that's still an open case because it's never been solved, um, or whether when he died that was closed. I'm I'm really not too sure about that. But the policeman uh, who were involved in that case were at Malcolm's talk and I think that that even in itself says a lot these people 100% believed uh, Bob Taylor and what had happened to him um, because of I, I guess his, his recounting the story and the, just generally the kind of person that he was who was not at all interested in uh, UFOs and uh, anything like that uh, so that was the, that was the the Bob Taylor incident, um, and there's been lots of uh, variations of of uh, reasons for that happening, and some people still believe it. It might have been a <clears throat> a seizure of some kind, but as I say, that was medically ruled out. Uh, some people have said it was. Um, 
I think there was uh, something similar on Doctor Who at, uh, about a month or so previously. That was another thing. I don't know if Bob Taylor watched Doctor Who, so we can't really see uh, whether he his imagination might have picked this up. But even if it did, why did he see it like that? And why did he pass out? And why are his trousers ripped? You know, Malcolm still has those trousers, pass them around the entire audience. Um, you know, so so these are questions. I mean, that's that's physical evidence there, mm. um, and and these were trousers that were like really like workman's trousers you know they're really thick material really difficult to tear um and and they've been torn to like just like slits down the side um so it's a puzzle Uh, what i don't believe certainly is the um somebody said it was a mirage of venus (laughs) <laughs> and I think that that is just oh, total, I'm um, sorry, but uh, I don't mean to make fun of anyone, but to come out with that is total stupidity. It really is. It's just how could you even come to that conclusion? And how can you press charges to Venus for criminal assault mm. as well? <laughs> yeah, I, well, exactly, exactly. Now, um, I think across the other side of the motorway, there's this other uh, facility at barbed wire and things like that. But he wasn't there. That's not where he was. And um, also, uh, I th- now I can't remember exactly what happened, but somebody said their their husband uh, worked at that facility and there was no barbed wire when he was there. She'd actually texted him at the time while she was sitting listening to the talk and he confirmed that um, that that was completely impossible uh, mm. to happen. So that was another theory knocked out the window. So whatever happened to Bob Taylor, we don't know but we know that something happened to him and that is what he says he saw. So if we assume that he's telling the truth, then that is what he saw. What it is might not, we we can't really take, maybe take that at face value, but that is what he said he saw. So that was the Bob Taylor experience mm. um, and, um, and quite a terrifying one for the man oh, as well. Oh. Uh, a lot of these UFO cases can be when you've got these things that come out and just grab you. Uh, I mean, I, I also heard uh, uh, Malcolm's uh, talk because he did the same talk or a version of the talk mm. at, um, at uh, the UFO Academy. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think it was when they were doing um, uh, one of these events down there. And I, I saw it. And again, I held the trousers as well and saw the mm. holes in them and things. I, I did ask if I could try them on, but I was declined. Um, but, um, okay. <laughs> but but yeah, it was uh, interesting because I think I was listening to the other guys from Glasgow who do the show on the network, um, Weirder Things, Innes and uh, I forget his name now, who present that show. And they were talking about this because they had gone to the same evening that you had. They were. They were there too. Yeah. yeah uh, and, and they were talking about this Doctor Who theory about the TARDIS dematerializing and mm. had had Bob Taylor seen the TARDIS dematerializing somehow conjectured it into this UFO. Now, the thing is, uh, my thing about that is if you had seen the TARDIS dematerializing and appearing, surely he would have hallucinated the actual Doctor Who TARDIS. TARDIS. Yeah. Not yeah. around yeah. Seracle... Saucer I agree. or dome shaped UFO. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I and, agree. And also, why didn't he, uh, for instance, if it was Doctor Who, have Cybermen coming out and attacking him or Daleks coming out and attacking him? Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, for him to describe something that you would not associate with spaceships, i.e., what looked like World War II landmine things that go in the sea, that, that mm-hmm. you know, they, they explode near ships and things, don't they? Uh, these things. Yeah, uh, that's how it, the best kind of an analogy you could give to these things, but they rolled towards him, mm-hmm. uh, which was quite an imaginative. If if you're making it up, quite an imaginative way of doing it. Yeah, you, know, you could have said, "Oh, an alien came out with a ray gun and zapped me, and I fell backwards." But no, these two mechanical things would seem harder to, um, what's the word? Harder to believe. Mm. Came came towards him and knocked him yeah. out. 
Now, mm-hmm. I, I did ask Malcolm whether Bob Taylor was regressed under hypnosis, and he said no, he wasn't, which is a bit unfortunate because I'm sure that would have been a second level to this story. And um, unfortunately, we we never got it. Um, that would have been great. But um, I, I don't know if that is unfortunate because a hypnosis regression is a really dodgy business. Um, it, it, has a very big risk of false memory syndrome and uh, then you can't tell uh, the the truth from fiction after that so i i tend to when it comes to things like this advise people not to try regression unless it's just to sharpen what they've already seen but to take with a heavy pinch of salt uh, anything new that appears in it uh, I'm, and I'm seeing that as a, a hypnotherapist. I'm a, a trained hypnotherapist, co- co- <laughs> cognitive, be- yeah, I'm a cognitive behavioural hypnotherapist. So I do know what I'm talking about when I say that. Right. Uh, it's and and I've tried. I've done self hypnosis um, to see what would happen, and I did conjure up some some things from the imagination. Um, or did I? That's and that's the thing. That is what you're left with. Did that happen? Did it not happen? And uh, and, until it fades again, like a few weeks later, you are left with that um, that notion of it did happen or it feels like it happened. Uh, So and this was like an an alien encounter that that I uh, went into. Um, But it it did feel afterwards that uh, it had actually happened. And I thought, right, because I wanted to experience that to see, like, right, false memory syndrome. What? How? How does it happen? And uh, could I experience it myself? So, um, there you go. But it seemed to be quite useful in the case of uh, Betty and Barney Hill, the people that were abducted in 1961, who were coming down from through Canada to, to North America to their home. And they were traveling overnight and they were abducted by a craft of some sort and taken aboard. And it's only when they got home, like four hours later, than they should have done. They thought, well, we remember this weird light in the sky and that was it kind of thing. But... Uh, someone suggested they get hypnotized and and they went through it and and in those days there wasn't really any kind of back cat back catalog of knowledge to fall back on about aliens mm. and ets and flying saucers it was all a bit of a, a new thing for people because not many people certainly from from the media's point of view were, were being abducted mm-hmm. uh but but they came forward with an incredible story of being taken on board and even to the point where Betty talked about one of the aliens coming through into the room and trying to take her teeth out. And apparently it was because they'd already previously located Barney's teeth, which came out fairly easily. uh, And they were confused because obviously Barney was wearing dentures and they assumed Betty's would be the same. So they came and tried to take her teeth (laughs) out and they wouldn't come out because hers were were real. (laughs) um, But that only came through under hypnosis it wasn't suggested to her or anything like that it was just one of these things yeah, uh, but she did know that the, the thing about Barney's teeth coming out and all that it, yeah. was, in her, it was in her mind but I'm, not also, that that, I'm not saying that I'm not saying that's the case but I'm just no, saying it was in yeah. her mind there was also the star chart thing when uh, it was late uh, with Stanton Friedman I believe doing the research on that and this lady who was an astronomer um, Betty asked one of the aliens where do you come from and he said well do you know where you are in the galaxy and she says no he says well we can't really explain to you where we're from even if you don't know where you're from but it, it show her a sort of star chart of sorts and under hypnosis she recalled the points of where the stars were and mm. it took this lady i can't remember her name something like 10 years to work out and obviously this was before computers and cgi or anything like that she was using small beads on things on a sort of um uh, a, 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 a cube shaped um, wire box or something with threads going through them and she was trying to create literally a miniature star system using the drawing uh, which could then be viewed at all different angles 
uh, to sort of work out what star system it could be. And it took this lady who was an astronomer, sort of like so many attempts to get it right. She was very, very dedicated. And it took something like 10 years to come up with this star system um, in a three-dimensional model that she had made that matched uh, Betty's drawing. And it turned out to be um, Zeticular Rick reticuli or whatever I can't say the star system Zeta reticuli that's the one that's yeah. the one I, I often pop by there to get bread um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, yeah so so that's where that one's coming and that's supposedly where all the greys are coming from you see supposedly mm. anyway well, they're supposed to be the negative ones aren't they the Zeta reticulans well mm. especially if they're taking your teeth out I guess so mm. yeah um, but yeah uh, very very interesting because this is before the greys really made an appearance on the world stage this was the first kind of description of them um they had obviously perhaps made appearances elsewhere maybe um uh, maybe at the roswell crash for instance and um uh, elsewhere um but this was the first time they'd become more known about on the world stage of uh, abductions because as i say abductions were not very well known about. And also the other thing about that particular case was that uh, Barney was a black man and Betty was a white lady. And in 1961, um, it wasn't a very, very, um, what's say, favorable to have an interracial marriage at that time in America. And uh, you'd have got a lot of bad press for a, a white woman marrying a black man. And yet they still came out and told their story. Um, and they faced that kind of... Uh, double ridicule if you like um for the interracial connection but also for the fact that they've been taken aboard this this craft um for people that want to know more about that it's called the interrupted journey the book by john g fuller who, who wrote an account of it and i think you can probably still get copies of it on amazon or secondhand copies but brilliant book worth reading i think it was later made into a film with james Earl jones playing part of barney who is obviously famous for the voice of darth vader just my little anecdotal things there <laughs> So there we go. Yeah. So yeah. hypnotherapy, I do believe it has its place. Um, I believe, though, you got to, uh, you can't, as we had this guy do a talk for us the other night at the paranormal meetup group called Doug Buckingham, and he said that he's regressed many people, but he says the key is not to lead them uh, with your own ideas of what mm -hmm. it could be. For instance, he said that in this particular regression, this lady had a fear of water, and so he said, just go back, keep going back, keep going back. Where do you find yourself? And she says, I'm on this big boat. And she turned out to be five years old or something like that. And uh, this this boat is out in the Atlantic. And so Doug thought, hmm, OK. And what happens next? She goes, well, we've hit an iceberg and we're sinking. And so he said, and what's your name? And she said her name, whatever it was. And so a few weeks later, they checked up on the passenger list of the Titanic mm -hmm. to see who had died. And this name that this, this lady had given as a little girl had come up. Wow. And it was after this kind of uh, hypnosis regression that her fear of water then went away, you mm -hmm. see. So, um, but he said, I was absolutely aware of not to bring up any words like, oh, are you on the Titanic? Mm -hmm. so, no, mm -hmm. no leading yeah. question. Yeah. And yeah. so long as, you know, you, you know, when you regress these people, you don't want to say, are oh, you on a spaceship with greys? No, you don't want to say that. <laughs> no, you just want to say so. what happens next and just let mm -hmm. them tell the story. Because you, you spoke to Calvin Parker recently, didn't you? I did, yes, that's right. And he's yeah. been regressed, hasn't he, a few times? Um, I believe so, yeah. A very interesting guy, very interesting incident. Um, that was the, the last show that I did, uh, if listeners want to give that a wee listen. And that's the Pascagoula um, case? The, pa the Pascagoula incident. Yeah. 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 yeah very interesting. What's, what's your take on that? I, I don't really know. Um, uh, like I say, it's interesting. Uh, it, it mirrored, I thought, the... Um, the A70 UFO incident in Scotland a little bit. I'm quite interested uh, w with these incidents that affect uh, particularly two men. You know, I've heard of this several times. Um, two, two men that are like on their own um, 
and that was the case in the A70 UFO incident. There was another case down in England. Um, there was somebody at one of the conferences down there that I heard relating the story. And quite often, one of the people, one, one of the men, don't want to get involved with ufology or, or and they're much more shy about it. Uh, the, the A70 incident was very interesting. Um, the the two gentlemen were uh, coming back from a uh, from Edinburgh. They were going to um, a place that should have only taken them, I think, half an hour to get to, and they ended up. They they came to a part um, where the the reservoir was, and uh, there was this big UFO across the road. Uh, when Gary put his foot down and, and drove underneath it, these uh, emitted these um, like shimmering lights and everything went black. The next thing, they were out on the road, like wavering on the road. Um, their seatbelts were undone. And when they got to their destination, they had an hour and a half of missing time that they could not account for. And they had marks on their bodies, they had nightmares the next day and uh, and, and for the next few weeks uh, they experienced these kind of things. They got they got in touch with um, SPI and Malcolm uh, arranged a regression for them and uh, they come out with a lot of uh, these things under regression about um, aliens taking them aboard this ship and uh, conducting experiments on them. So that I thought was a similar, but I'm quite interested in this. Uh, it seems to be, there seems to be a thing, you know, with uh, two men being abducted. And I just wonder why. Um, was there any mention in this regression of what, uh, of seeing any aliens or what they might look like? Um, I, I think they were described as being like greys. Uh, I, can, I can't remember now fully, but the entire story is online. It's written by Brian Allen, who's one of our speakers, incidentally, at uh, the UFO conference in uh, June next year. Uh, and, and he gives a full account online of uh, the A70. It's the A70 UFO incident. Uh, when so when did this happen, this particular case, Alison, the A70 incident? I think it was the early 90s that that happened. Right. It rings a bell. I'm sure I've heard Malcolm talk about it uh, mm -hmm. uh, talk. Um, yeah, there's uh, my mind's a bit blurry in some of these cases because I think one blurs into the other about what, what sort of instances happen and like loads of aliens floating across a field to mm. people. But that mm. might be another case or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, yeah, very interesting. So I think we're coming to the end of the show now. So um, anything you want to say quickly before we wrap up? No, nothing for me. Not even a Merry Christmas to anybody? <laughs> oh, Merry, <laughs> Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I hope that uh, some of the listeners can join us at uh, next year's conference. It'd be nice to meet people. Okay. And where's that taking place and when? It is on the. It's in the Queen Margaret Union in Glasgow University Gardens, and uh, that's on Saturday the sixth of June, at and, ten a.m. And how do they get tickets? Do they buy on the door or is the website yeah, or something? If they email me at spi scotland at gmail dot com, then I can sort out tickets. And if they do that before the twenty fifth of December, then they'll get the ticket for nine pounds instead of ten pounds. So there you go. <laughs> oh, uh, a. a Brilliant bargain before Brexit. Yeah. <laughs> the bargain anyway. I mean, like at ten pounds, it's that's for like seven speakers a whole day. That's really good. Um, yeah, yeah. A whole day of it. And we also have like a raffle and their stalls and you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's it's really very, very cheap to go to. Do you only have Scottish speakers there, or is it any speaker from any country or uh we don't UK? We don't only have Scottish speakers, but we do try to promote Scottish speakers because the 
don't really get, um, they kind of get forgotten, I think, you know. Um, uh, so we, we do try to encourage uh, our our people in their native land to get up there and say something. And there's been a few first time speakers that we've had and they've been fantastic. And it's given them a chance to uh, get their research uh, out there. And it might just be like Mark Anderson. He's been on my show and uh, he goes around all these big houses, uh, big uh, castles and houses and things like that and collects stories of hauntings. Uh, so that's like very worthwhile stuff that he's doing and he's very dedicated to it. And then there's Dennis Doyle who gave a talk on Mothman last year, which is not talked about very much. So, you know, there's a few first time speakers and they, they just, they, both those uh, gentlemen did brilliantly. They really did. And I was delighted that it gave them the chance to, to get up there and do that. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, we, we, we're not solely, it's not solely, um, Scottish speakers. We have had Peter Robbins from the U S Oh yeah. Um, yeah, we um, this coming year, 2020, Cal Cooper is going to be coming along. And so uh -huh. he's coming up from England. Um, so so there will be, uh, a, a, the, the, you know, there have been and there will be. Uh, we, we don't sort of say, no, you can't come because you're not Scottish. <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> you, can't, yeah. you can't speak at our conference. But we, we do prefer to get it create a space for Scottish speakers to platform for them to get their story. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Great right. stuff. Okay. All right. But thank you very, very much indeed, Alison, for taking thank you. part in the Paranormal Peep Show for joining us. Finally mm. got there in the end. Uh, Andy, <laughs> any last words? Uh, no, I just uh, wish people a very Merry Christmas. I uh, hope you get lots of presents, mince pies, mulled wine and thoroughly drunk. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and oh, won't the, uh, the Queen's speech be interesting this year? <laughs> Another Anis Horribilis. <laughs> yes. that's, that's, that's worth paying a licence fee alone just to listen to that. Um, <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, it's a very Merry Christmas from myself, uh, Alison and Andy on the Paranormal Peep Show, and we wish you a wonderful 2020. And it's good night from us. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. 